Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ANSYS with Calvin Chow, who's going to talk to you today about a methodology for signing off on complex SOCs. So Calvin, what do we have to watch out for? How do we deal with, with uh, signing off in context? And just how complex is it going to get? So as you know, many of the chips that are being signed off at the lower process nodes now are extremely complex. Uh, and involve an integration of many different pieces of IP or blocks coming together. And to validate the power delivery network for a particular chip uh, is becoming more and more challenging. So I want to focus on three aspects of uh, a methodology for sign-off today. And the first one I want to talk about is a approach to early stage prototyping and signing off of the power delivery network. So to start with, uh, rather than waiting for uh, designs to become more complete to do the uh, analysis of your power delivery network, uh, you can actually do uh, a lot of, make a lot of design decisions at a very early stage in the design cycle, uh, as early as a floor plan stage. So in the very beginning, you can actually take a design and either it's a new rev of a previous design or even if it's a new microarchitecture, you can take a floor plan and spec out a power grid uh, you know, from the lower metal layers all the way to the bumps. And based on some information about the power, uh, either coming from your RTL or coming from previous designs, you can get an idea of how to stretch your power grid and understand the uh, impact of the demand current on your EM and IR for, for each of your blocks. So even at a very early stage, I could take a, a design floor plan as such and, and lay out my power grid uh, power grid from lower level metal layers all the way to the bumps and then even place power switches and understand um, the kind of impact these power gates will have on your design. So I mentioned power gates because you know, there's a strong focus on low power design nowadays and to control the power uh, many people implement different kinds of power gain topologies and of course you may have a top level power gain topology or power gates used within each block. And to understand you know, how these uh, power gates will impact your IR drop or even through your design is very important. And you, know, you want to make these decisions at a very early stage in the design cycle. So in an early analysis approach you can spec out your entire power grid, you can assign power for each of your blocks and lay out a different you know, sets of power switch topologies. For example, here I have a, a very fine grade um, layout for my power switches. Over here, I have a coarser power gate uh, topology. So I can look and run an analysis at an early stage and find out you know, what kind of drops am I getting across my power gates, as well as uh, what kind of current draw am I going to get as a result of charging up all these internal gated domains in my design? So this used to be done at a much later stage in a design, right? Now you can do it much earlier. What's the benefit here? The benefit is you can actually understand uh, what kinds of weaknesses or, or how robust your power grid is much earlier rather than later on when your design is fully routed and you realize, oh, I have an IR drop, what do I do, what can I do to mitigate this, you can, do, you can understand these uh, kinds of issues at a much earlier stage. So let's say, for example, I lay out this power gate topology and I make an estimate about you know, how much capacitance is connected to each of these power gates. And when I turn on the power gates, there's going to be inrush current charging up my entire gated domain. And I can understand, you know, based on this topology of my power gates, and let's say a, a, a turn on sequence, let's say I have a daisy chain turn on sequence of each of my power gates, based on that I can evaluate, okay, what kind of delay do I need between the enables of each of my power gates, um, how close together do I need to lay them out, and do an analysis and see what's the actual current draw when I turn on my power gates. Is it going to exceed some DIDT that's going to result in a large voltage drop somewhere else in the design, or at the same time, you know, how long will it take to ramp up my gated domain based on the capacitance connected to it? So, so in general, having a better understanding of the impact of my layout 
at an early stage on my actual design much later. You, you can make these decisions at an early stage. At the same time, you know, things like uh, understanding where my pad locations are in my design. Are there going to be pads that aren't connected uh, well enough in terms of not uh, providing enough current to switch or too much current to the design? Things like that, you can make a, a reasonable analysis at a much earlier stage. So, you know, we've heard a lot about power gate analysis. How does that impact placement on what you're doing on placement round? Right, so there's, there's two things. Uh, one, we have to make sure that uh, your power gates don't present too much resistive drop for the rest of your design. For example, uh, your power gate is essentially some form of resistance between your gated and your ungated domain. So be, when, you're, when your gated domain is functioning, uh, we want to make sure that your, the way your power gates are connected don't result in too much of a drop on your uh, cells or devices connected to your gated domain. That's one thing. Um, the second thing is, uh, as I mentioned, when we turn on the power gates, uh, we will be charging, or your design will be essentially charging all the devices connected to your gated domain. So we want to ensure that one, when you turn on these power gates, it's done in a way that doesn't result in uh, too high of a peak in rush current and that there's not too much DIDT there. Uh, second is we also want to make sure that you know, your voltage of your gated domain does fully ramp up in the, in the specified or needed time. So within an early analysis, you can actually experiment with different power gate topologies, different power gate turn on sequences and understand you know, what kinds of uh, current draw you'll be getting when you turn them on, as well as what kind of IR drop you'll be seeing on your gated domain because of your switches. So how important is accurate modeling in all of this? I mean, one of the things that we keep hearing is that models are have always been models that are one step removed, but not necessarily really accurate. That's right. Yeah. So. If you look at these lower process nodes, especially as we're moving into FinFET technologies, uh, your operating voltage is much lower than it was before. And as a result, you have a lot less noise margins to work with. Uh, a 100 millivolt drop in a newer process node is going to have a much more significant impact on delay than it did in a previous node. So as you mentioned, when we're doing modeling uh, at the SOC level, you know, in the past when we present a model of a block, it's some form of abstraction is there and some form of accuracy is lost. Now, as we approach these newer technology nodes, we have to ensure that each of your blocks is actually you know, much more accurately modeled because you have a lot less noise margin to work with. So if you take an example here, uh, I have two blocks. You know, one block I'm modeling as uh, you know, just some current sinks on the ports as they connect to the top level power grid. And the other, I'll have a more detailed uh, distributed model of how these currents are plugged in into this particular block. So you can see in this case, you may lose out on the kinds of um, current draw due to shared power grid at the lower level metals or on the metals that aren't related to these ports. Whereas in the first top model, we actually capture you know, the amounts of current distribution or current distribution through the resistance network internal to the block and also model how this current draw is impacted by uh, the, the connection to the rest of the power grid. So there's two, two benefits to this. One, you sign, when you sign off a block or IP, you're signing it off within context of the IP itself. So you can analyze it with some voltage sources at your top level metal and, and make sure you meet the IR and EM requirements. But when you plug this block into the top level, you not only do you need to verify that the impact of the top level power grid doesn't cause you know, some unforeseen drop or EM violation inside the block, but you also want to see the impact of this block on the neighbors. So both of those are, are very important, which is why we want to bring in as accurate a model as possible for these subblocks. So how accurate has simulation been in all this? We, we keep hearing stories that the simulation is running out of steam and that it's really not picking up everything on a very, very complex chip. Right, so I think in the past, uh, in order to enable simulation of complex systems, a lot of assumptions had to be made and a lot of simplifications were done. And 
due to that, there's going to be some accuracy loss in the simulation. But now we want to analyze the power delivery network for a die within the context of the uh, system that it's in. Uh, namely, namely uh, simulation should imitate reality. Uh, when you sign off your die power grid, you shouldn't just sign it off uh, just for the die alone, because in reality, the die is connected to the package, the package is connected to a board, the board connects to a VRM, and your actual voltage source is there. So when we look at the power delivery network, uh, looking at the die in isolation leads to some accuracy loss. What exactly do you mean by power delivery network? We've heard that term bandied about a lot. It means a lot of things to a lot of people. Right. So when we say power delivery network, we're looking at essentially the power grid that is supplying current to all your switching devices on your in your design. So you know, uh, an SOC or a, a chip is made up of a lot of transistors. Those transistors uh, switch at different times. Uh, the, in order to you know, each time they switch, they draw an amount of current. Uh, the power grid that supplies this current to all these switching devices, that's the power delivery network we're looking at. So it doesn't, it extends beyond just the chip, the chip, you know, power grid for VCC or VSS or whatever power domains are there. It also extends to the package and to the board. Essentially, you'll have a battery or some, some form of voltage supply on your PCB that supplies all this current and charge to these devices. So in the past, uh, when we sign off a die, uh, we made some assumptions about the, you know, the voltage seen at the pads of the die. Uh, you know, in the past, often you sign off the die by itself, or you just assume some kind of lumped model to represent the package or the board. If you see this example here, you know, a very coarse gained approach. Uh, you know, in reality, your die will have a lot of different power pads, a lot of different ground pads. Uh, in this model, we're basically lumping all the power pads into you know one connection, uh, and then you know adding a, par a package parasitic to that VCC or VSS connection. But what this does is it assumes the same voltage at all the different VCC pad connections on your die. So you're losing out on the distributed impedance of your package and how that would actually impact the current distribution on your die. Because I've mentioned earlier, uh, you know, at the lower process nodes, um, accuracy is a lot more important. The noise margins you have to work with aren't in the hundreds of millivolts. They may be less than that. So whatever accuracy loss you have when you lump everything together, that is no longer um, you know, safe to accept. Uh, in the end, we want to model uh, a distributed power delivery network of both your package and your die. What this means is, rather than lumping all the parasitics of the package to a single, you know, to a grouped location on the die, we want to be able to look at the impedance through each of the individual bumps on a chip and see the full distributed parasitic network of your package when we're running the analysis on the die. So when you actually hook up a distributed package model to your die and we run a simulation based on, you know, the currents that are drawn by the devices, Th those devices will actually see this entire power delivery network and, and this will impact how the charge is distributed and the resulting IR drops and EMs that you see on the interconnects. One of the problems with FinFETs is that they greatly increase the current density because you're in not only increasing the density of the transistors, but you're also increasing the density of the uh, current up and down those transistors. Right. How do you deal with that? So that, that again adds to the importance of uh, modeling this distributed power delivery network because um, with FinFETs, like you mentioned, uh, there's a much higher current density and a lot of localized uh, high current density. Uh, because of that, you're, you can't make the assumption that uh, your bumps are going to draw uniform amounts of currents um, across the design. Rather, there's going to be places or hot spots uh, where you know, there's going to be extremely high current density versus other areas where there won't be as much. So being able to model how that current distribution is you know, across your power delivery network in an accurate manner would require a distributed package model uh, connected to your die in your simulation.